Welcome, beautiful people, and thank you for joining us on Till the Wheels Fall Off, a podcast by Two Folk Couple. I'm Matt. And I'm Paige. And we're here to inspire others, to bring you guys into our lives and tell you a little bit about our journey. Over 20 years together, we've learned a few things. We're going to work toward being the best version of yourself possible. We're going to dig into building a positive mindset, discuss mental health, addiction recovery, improving fitness, building businesses, and insight into what it takes to navigate life today. Welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of Till the Wheels Fall Off. I'm Matt. I'm Paige. And we've got just a couple of housekeeping items, some exciting announcements, and then a uh, issue of concern for us. Yes. So first things first, the website is fully functional. Our new website, twfo.com, that's tufo.com. We got the the four-letter domain finally. Yay! A rebuilt, revamped website. It is absolutely beautiful mostly thanks to Paige. Spent a ton of time putting this thing together. It's got, it's, I can't even, it's, there's too much. It's got so much good stuff on it. It's got, we've got some guides, free guides available there for a lot of these things we talk about in our episodes. There's like, a store, there's book recommendations. The oh, store is awesome. Yeah, we, we've, which, we've got journals on there. Journal. Paige is holding one up right now. Uh, two faux journals. We talked about journaling, the importance of doing it. If you don't have one, you can decorate it with cool stickers. Yeah. If you want a two faux couple one, they are available in the store along with, as she mentioned, all the books that we, we reference throughout all of these episodes. They're all available in there. I think with the exception of courage to change, which for some reason wasn't available, right? No, uh, yeah, there was something weird on that. I need to add that. We'll find. We'll figure out we'll a figure way to get it out. on. We'll yeah. figure out a way to get it on. That is anyway. like my number one book that I recommend. <laughs> but anyway, tufo dot com is the new website, and it's beautiful. We're proud of it. Take a look at it. Uh, you can schedule a free consultation there as well to speak with us if you'd like to get in touch with us directly. Um, it's got tons of awesome information. I'm All right. Incredibly proud of it. Yay. Okay. The next thing, this issue of concern. So, therapy has been an important part of our journey. Mm-hmm. When I think back to like especially you, man, especially you over like the last five to six years, like you have come so far in part because of working one-on-one with a therapist on a regular basis. Yep. Extremely important. I also am a huge believer in therapy. I'm a believer that therapy is not a substitute for things like a recovery program. It's not a substitute for having someone like a mentor or a coach, but worked in conjunction with these things, you can get massive and quick results. Absolutely. And there is, if you don't know, there's a mental health crisis in our country, partly because there are not enough therapists to go around. So the fact of the matter is that there are more students in school today studying to be therapists than ever before, and it's still not enough to meet the growing demand and need for therapy in the next five to 10 years. Roughly half of Americans live in a professional mental health shortage area. Something like 150 million Americans live in an area where they just don't have access to therapists. And 55% of adults who need care don't get it. And we've, we've been through this before. Yes. And here's the most defeating thing in the world. When you are reaching out to a therapist, you're generally in crisis mode. Right. You need help pretty quickly. You're not reaching out because you're like, maybe in the next three to six months, I'll just do something to better myself. I should go ahead and get a therapist now. That's not usually how it works. You reach out when you're in most need. And what happens a lot is you get answering machines or you get unreturned voicemails or you get people that tell you just frankly, we're full. We can't, we don't have room for more patients right now. Mm -hmm. And it is the most defeating thing in the world. I think back to when you were looking for, when I was looking for you a therapist because you weren't in a position yet to, to go out and get one. You were just, I was a mess. You had had anxious, anxious about it and anxiety about it. So I was reaching out. And so I was in a different position to pick up the phone and make the next call. And the next call, I made like 10 to 12 calls before I found somebody. It was defeating. And I can't imagine being in a position of crisis and having the motivation to pick up and make the next call. Most people I think just give up. Yeah. So I am, I sit on the board of directors for a foundation called the Counseling for the Future Foundation with a good friend of mine, Dr. Christopher Taylor, who founded it. Um, What we are doing is it really boils down to ROI, return on investment. When you want to become a therapist, you have to go through a a lot of school, Mm -hmm. graduate level programs that set you back $60,000. And then you have to go through two years of what's called an associateship which is paid like maybe 35 to 45 grand. 
and you've got massive amounts of student debt. For, so for a lot of people who actually want to become therapists, they don't do it because it just doesn't make financial sense. Right. And so these altruistic people, these people, these empathetic creatures who want to be therapists can't afford to do it. So Counseling for the Future Foundation is changing that narrative. So we are taking on applications very soon to put people through their graduate programs debt free. That's so awesome. It's an it's a it's a nonprofit, um, and it's something that I believe in so freaking much. Yep. I mean, this is truly a a labor of love for us. We are we are not paid. I gain nothing from this other than putting more therapists into the field to strengthen our country's mental health. I mean, imagine a country with lower divorce rates. Um, less children in foster care, um, people with a better understanding of, of how their mind works and ways to get through crisis. We are really, what we're doing, we're investing in human capital here. And so you can find it on our website. I think under the About Us section, there's a link at the bottom for the Counseling for the Futures Foundation. Mm-hmm. Or you can go to counselingforfutures.org. Or wait, let me make sure. Counselingfutures.org. Or I think it's what it is. How about just go to our website and go to about us. <laughs> and we'll put it in the um, the notes. It is counselingfutures.org. Right. You can make a small donation, not asking for anything. At the very least, share it out. Make other people aware so we can get more therapists into the field and strengthen mental health around the country. So needed right now. Okay. Now with that, what do you want to talk about? Oh. Okay. I know what we're talking about. This is probably our most requested topic. And so when we started this podcast, I didn't think this is what we'd be talking about more than anything. Yeah, because you, yeah. (laughs) But we are talking about, once again, in a different way, detaching with love. What we're really talking about is, why can't I change other people? Yeah. Why can't I change other people? Why don't they listen to my logic and just do the right thing? Right. We hear this for more people than I can count. It's, you know, the spouse of an addict or the family member of an addict will reach out and they say, how do I fix them? What do I do? How do I help them get help? Yeah. So that's the topic today. And it's something that I think requires its own episode because we do hear from people so much. I'd love to be able to reference this in the future. Mm -hmm. And for anyone that's dealing with anyone tough in their relationship, any type of relationship, it doesn't necessarily have to be an addict, but someone who's maybe in borderline narcissistic or just doesn't want to listen and they're incredibly stubborn and they're it's just not working there's no development in that relationship this is also applicable to you so if you just heard this addict thing again you're like all right i'm tuning out stay tuned there's going to be something here for you as well yeah for sure okay so doesn't benefit anybody what is the first thing people reach out with to you page generally it's you that they reach out to well, what, they, do, what do they say they say how do i help them get help how do i help them get help and That's what we do, that we're people pleasers. As codependents, we are fixers. We want to make sure everybody's happy, and we want this person to be the best version of themselves possible. But? That's not the way it works. No, we can't fix anybody. That's not the way it works, man, and we're going to tell you why. So what are some things that we try to do to fix other people? Um, well, we blame them for a lot of things. So we try to get them to empathize with us by blaming them. Yeah. How's that usually go over? Oh, it usually goes into a big fight and it fuels the fire. Incredibly well, right? Yeah, it's awful. (laughs) Okay. What else? What are some other things that people try to do that they've reached out to you with? Like, Hey, I've got this addict in my life and I've done X, Y, Z. I can say that like I, even in my experience, I'd say like looking at their finances and telling them that, look, our finances are shit right now. You need help. (laughs) Yeah. I think what, and there's a million other examples for, for things that people try to do, but what we're really trying to do is we're trying to rationalize with them for why their behavior is harmful and why it's not getting us where we want to be in life why this isn't productive right we beg we plead we are just constantly trying to get them to understand where we're coming from you know we we make threats of leaving but we never follow through on those yeah 
It's different than a boundary. Yes, it is. A boundary is something you actually follow through with. Right. A threat is just a, it's just that. It's right. a threat. So we would. Just words. I did threats all the time and it never, I never follow through with my threats. But I think people hold on to this, this belief that they can change other people if they just put the right combination of adjectives, verbs, and stuff together where it's like, I just need to say it in a different way that's going to resonate. Mm-hmm. And then they'll listen and they'll understand my point and then we're going to live happily ever after. Right. And it's this, God, I don't, I don't want to demean this by any means because this is someone who's fighting for their family. This is someone who's fighting for their marriage. This is someone who's fighting for the future of their children. Very like passionate people. Incredibly passionate and rightfully so. Absolutely. But the other side of that coin is that you're dealing with somebody who is incapable of experiencing empathy or taking any type of personal responsibility and they have no self-awareness. Right. Their job as an addict, I felt like my job was to justify. Yeah. I'm going to justify. I don't care what you say next. I'm going to justify. Yep. I'm just going to gaslight the absolute shit out of you and make you think that you're crazy Uh so I can keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. And I will speak from an addict's perspective because this, I was this guy for quite a while. We don't mean to hurt other people. When I set out and I put drugs in my body for the first time, it never occurred to me that this could be harmful to the people that I love the most. I never wanted to hurt anybody that I love. I just wanted to feel better. I just wanted to feel better. I didn't want to hurt anymore. I wanted to feel comfortable in my own skin. I didn't want to hurt. And so I think it's important to remember that this isn't a bad person. This is just an incredibly sick person. Yeah. And that when you when you meet that with some degree of compassion, it changes the narrative in your mind in a lot of ways and it changes the conversation to a degree as well. Yes. Because attacking people, you don't get anywhere with it. Right. Nowhere. Right. And I know that's hard to say to to a wife who has been essentially abandoned and put in financial crisis and whose children are being shorted of a father or could the other version of this is the wife who's who's an abuser. Mm -hmm. I know it's tough for me to say to them that you should have compassion, but the fact of the matter is that coming from, from one, we don't mean to do this to people. Our brains have been completely hijacked. And if I can make a rational decision at the time, I would have done it. Right. And that also doesn't mean that we allow you to treat us like crap either. This is probably the most, (laughs) what she just said right there was the most important thing in all of this is Uh that as you're trying to rationalize and justify and get your point across that what you're doing is harmful, you need to stop. What you just said right there was that you should still have some degree of pride to say, you don't get to treat me like this. Yes. You don't get to treat, this is my life too. Right. I deserve love. I deserve validation. I deserve someone to care about me and to wonder where I'm at. I deserve someone to think about my feelings. Yeah. And you don't get to treat me like that. Right. That is not okay. Right. So having said all that compassion crap for the addict, the other side of that coin is this, that just because they're an addict doesn't mean that you allow them to treat you like crap. It doesn't mean that you condone the behavior. Right doesn't mean you can don't it so how do we do this i'll let you take it from here dog Uh, okay (laughs) well first we have to look at reality and we have to have the courage to change our actions because what is the one thing that we can actually control our own actions and behaviors our own actions we can control how we react we can control how we speak to others we can't control how they're speaking to us yeah uh, uh, so cognitive dissonance is the it's the difference between what is reality and what we believe in our minds to be true. Mm-hmm. It's it's the gap between those two. Yeah. And I think that there's a ton of cognitive dissonance when looking at an addict and saying, I can just convince them to change. Just remember that first point that, that Paige just made is that we only have control over ourselves. Mm-hmm. We cannot control other people. And more often than not, when you're challenging someone to change, they're not going to do it. It's got to be their idea. Oh, yeah. Change comes from within. We've talked about this in our accountability episode, that mm-hmm. change comes from the inside. Right. They have to want it. And there's no words you can give them 
that will make them want it. There's no argument you can have that will make them want it. Right. So it's looking at the reality and what is the reality is that I can't change anybody but myself. Mm -hmm. So that being said, if that is an absolute, is that if that's the truth, then you should actually be somewhat relieved because there is still an avenue where you can be happy. Absolutely. But it involves what? Work. <laughs> Work on yourself. On yourself. Not the addict. No. Not the other person. Not no. the difficult person in your life. Not your pain in the ass mom or dad or sibling or your friends or whoever it right. might be in your grandmother. I don't know. Like We're the reasonable ones. So we should be able to make these decisions easier. We should be able to change the narrative a little bit instead of going down the same cycle over and over again like with the addict. Yeah, this this belief that you can change them, attempting yes. to change them, right. being basically thrown through a washing machine as you are gaslit to no end and and manipulated and then come out the other side, it's like, oh, I can change them. And then it starts all over again. Right. So let's put a stop there now and accept reality and acknowledge that we have to change. So how do we do that? Let's think of a certain um, circumstance. Uh, you know, there's a lot of heated fights and arguments that happen between addicts and codependents. Oh, hell yeah. They're very heated and they're very difficult these. and they are, they're not healthy at all. So what's a healthy way that we can help people start this process? So within an actual argument, you're saying within an actual argument, because you cannot argue with an addict. I'm going to say that up front. You yeah, cannot, good luck. you will not win. It will be torture for you. And it's just a waste. It's of not energy. even really about winning. It's about like, are they going to oh, hear productive. anything that I say? No, there's no production. It's not going to be productive. It's not productible. It's not productive. <laughs> I was going to say something else and you just said that. So thanks, dear. <laughs> so you can't reason with an addict. Let's just put that up front. And sometimes I can be like, okay, you have that in the back of your mind. So now you know that you have to change your approach and not react how you usually want to react. So when we're in a fight with an addict, we want to react in a way that is like, I want to be heard. I want to tell you how it is. You need to feel my pain and then maybe things will change. But it's, it never works. Yeah, it's it's a natural feeling. Like, don't beat yourself up for wanting them to hurt. It's natural. Oh, 100%. It's a natural state of being that right. you have hurt me tremendously. Why don't you have a piece of this and understand what it's like to be me for a moment? Right. So the first thing that you want to do if you're in the middle of an argument and you want to take control is you're going to take a deep breath and you're going to try to stay calm. Do your best to stay calm before you react. So just take a moment to breathe deeply. Like that is breathing is so important with any type of situation when you need to calm down because it does calm your nervous system. It's science y'all. It is. And I think it all starts with this thought that nothing I say is going to change them. And I think that it changes the argument and that changes your approach to it with starting with this deep breath. Yes. If, if you take a deep breath and you're still thinking, I'm going to say something that's going to change them, you're going to have a bad time. Yes. So having said that first point mm -hmm. and then going into this and taking a deep breath and just trying to remain calm. Yes. And it takes intention. So you have to remember that as well. And practice. This whole process we're telling you is going to take a lot of practice. Okay. What else? Um, use a neutral tone. So if you need to speak, use a neutral tone, but be assertive and because you're going to fuel the fire if you start screaming back at them yeah you know what's funny about the neutral tone thing is that this used to piss you off so bad oh my when God. i would do that when i would just stay calm <laughs> oh it used to make me so mad so be prepared for that that because you're probably human and you're you, and you're normally very angry when you argue and you're you have these outbursts and you fight back when you start using a neutral tone they're gonna think you don't care and they're or, gonna throw or they're gonna think you. you're playing some kind of like CIA mind games on them oh, like, yeah. what are you trying to pull here what is this oh yeah it's i saw gonna, this on law it's and order going to change your arguments and it's going to be kind of scary at first <laughs> but use a neutral tone stay calm yeah what's next validating the other people's other person's feelings so even if you disagree with them simply acknowledging that the feeling exists can help diffuse the situation and and stop some of the anger from their end mm -hmm. remember you're not condoning their feelings right you're simply validating them right so when i say i'm I stressed understand. and i've got this going on and my boss is a jerk and i have to get up at four in the morning simply saying i understand that must be really tough 
Yeah. And that's it. That's all you have to that's say. That's all you have to say. That's it. You don't have to go in any deeper. Now, this is where we're going to talk about using I statements because instead of in these type of arguments, you start blaming and pointing fingers at the other person constantly, right? You're like, you made me feel like this. You are a scumbag. You're, you know, you did this, you did that, you, you, you. I statements completely change the way the fight can go. Yeah. Think, think of a you statement as every time you say you, you're throwing a grenade over the, over the foxhole at them. Yeah. And that is going to end in one way. They're going to throw one back. Right. That's what happens as we addicts try to justify this. It just, then it's, then it's a pissing match. Now you're arguing with a child who uses drugs. Yes. It gets nowhere. Right. So I statements are great because they're non-confrontational. Yes. It's saying it's owning the emotion and saying, I feel this way Right. when you, I feel mm-hmm. that's totally different than just throwing out these grenades at you, 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 you. Yeah. Another thing they do, which is probably the biggest uh-huh. is that they promote empathy. Yes. So this is disarming. I remember when you would do this to me, even when I was in the middle of my worst, when she would say, I feel I, I am depressed and I am anxious and I'm lost and I don't know what to do. That broke my freaking heart. It could take my cold addict heart and just like <laughs> melt it because you're Aww. telling me how you feel. Yeah. You're not blaming me for the feeling. You're just telling me how you feel. And I'm right. like it for just for a moment. I can, I can kind of see clearly and I'm like, Oh crap. Yeah. It's, it's incredibly disarming and you're owning the situation, not blaming. Yeah. You're just owning your part in it. And it does promote empathy. Yes, it does. And not going to say it works every time, but it does help promote em- empathy. Right. Right. Give it a shot. Right. Uh, I statements also, I, I would say just in general, they encourage problem solving. They do, but probably not with an addict. <laughs> just going to be real here. <laughs> We're talking about a reasonable person who's sober. Generally, that's the case. Right, right. Um, really, these I feel statements can be very simple and quick and to the point. It doesn't need to go any further, but if it gets really heated and it's still going on and you have you see no resolution you can actually step away and ask for a break hell yeah you can say it again kiss my ass Matt. (laughs) yeah this is a sensitive subject when i was going through my healing process matt was sober for i don't know five-ish years and he would leave the house or he would leave the room or he would even turn off his phone when we got into arguments and it would piss me off. Like you would think that I was the addict in the relationship, but obviously I had my own issues. He was setting up these boundaries that I am not going to be talked to like this. I'm not going to deal with this right now. I can't emotionally handle it, handle it at this moment. So I'm stepping away. Yeah. For, for me, it was like this. I, I know myself and I, I'm self-aware enough to know that my brain can be saying, just let that go. That just, just let it go. That wasn't that big of a deal. My mouth will say, now listen here, motherfucker. Mm-hmm. Like you're not about to talk to me that way. Oh, yeah, and then, and, th- and then I've, <laughs> then I've just, you know, I've, then I've ruined every bit of goodwill I've built up trying to do these other things, validating feelings, using neutral tones, taking right. deep breaths. So I, I would have to remove myself from the room before it got worse. Yeah. It never got physical, but for some people that could be that happens too. Absolutely. And if you remove yourself from, from the room, you remove that option. Right. But, and if you have to leave your house. But leave. for me, it was like truly like I, I know that this is unproductive and I've got to get out of this situation. We can come back to this at a later time. It mm-hmm. is okay to ask for a cool down yes. or a break. Yes. And, and it's going to piss people off. It will. There's nothing. Yeah. It's, it's, it makes people so angry when you're like, I'm not going to give you the option to talk to me that way anymore. Right. And that's really hard for a codependent person because we feel these people's feelings and we take on a lot of what they say. So that's where you have to detach and learn how to detach and be like, okay, you know what? This is what's best for me in this moment. I'm going to try it because I've never tried it before and maybe it'll work differently this time. Yeah. It's, it's, there's, there's not necessarily a perfect science to doing this, No. but I think that it is, if it's anything at all, it is a process and it starts with the, understanding that you can't change other people. Mm -hmm. And if you just remember that, then your next action is pretty clear. If you can't change other people, then you don't try. You don't put the effort in to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. But it feels so natural, I think, for people to think that they can influence the actions of others. I think when we raise children, it's essentially what we're doing, right? 
Yeah. We're influencing their actions, but they're, they're, they're young. They're moldable. They trust us. Adults are different. Yeah. Especially ones with drug problems. Absolutely. You're not going to get anywhere. I'm no. telling you, that's just a fact. You're not going to get anywhere doing this. You were going to spin your wheels, wear yourself out. You're going to look up. It'll be 20 years later. And you're going to be wondering, what have I done with my life? Yep. Something I encourage spouses to do. This is coming from an addict is imagine what your life would look like. What, what would it take for you to be happy without the addict in your life? How would you design your life to create ultimate happiness without them and prepare as if? Yes. If you do that, you have set yourself up for happiness in yourself. You have set your children up for a safe environment to grow. Mm -hmm. You have set up the relationship with boundaries and you've put some, some healthy things in place for yourself. Yes. And then maybe just maybe the addict gets better, but if they don't, you've, you've still, you've still got happiness. You've still got something that works for you. It's very empowering. And something else I think that needs to be mentioned here is that when people are going through this process, like, and it is a process, the first step is often this realization that you can't change other people. I think it's quickly followed by this mourning period mm -hmm. where you're essentially mourning your relationship because you know, and you have this realization because you know, in your heart of hearts that this, this may never get better. And you kind of have to process the stages of mourning in that, that you've sort of lost this person in deciding to move on and do what's best for you. You've almost given up in some way. I think it's not so much giving up on the relationship, right. but, but you've given up on trying to change them exactly at, to, to your own detriment, right? which is a incredibly tough thing to do. And so our, our community is up and running the, the two full couple community. You can check it out on Facebook and it stays active. And this is a, this is a topic that's processed just about daily in there. I mm -hmm. think where people are coming in looking for really just looking to, to, to share what they're going through. It's like, man, this and is, this is my reality advice, right now, right. man. And what, what have you guys done to, to combat this? And there's a lot of people who are dealing with it. Some have come out the other side of it. People who are currently processing through it at different, you know, varying stages and they're, they're able to offer each other support. And I just, I love it in there. It's great. Mm -hmm. But there is this, this, you know, this realization that like, damn man, like the life that I dreamed, like this, this idea that I had of what my family and my life would look like is it's not happening. And it's, it's sad. It's, it, there's no other way to put it. It's, right. It's and painful. this might sound harsh, but put the energy that all that energy that you're trying to change the other person, put that energy into changing yourself and working on yourself. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Change is good because nothing changes. If nothing changes and you're in a spot that is the cycle is just continually going and you're not happy. So do you have to do something different? You're right. You've got to do something different. You have to make a change. You have to make a decision to change and to do it for you. And I know it's difficult. I'm not sitting here like saying this lightly this at is all. It's a very long process. That that like, you know, deciding to to sort of detach with love and compassion over someone's addiction or someone with an addiction is an easy thing to do because it's not. But the benefit of doing it is that you get to be happy because guess what? You deserved it all along. You always deserved that relationship. You always deserved to be happy, but you're just unfortunately going to have to create it yourself. Yeah. You can't count on them to do it. If you count on them to do it, there is a chance that they never get better. Right. Now I've seen this work two ways and it's split pretty 50 50. I've seen a lot of people work through addiction as a couple and get to the other side of it, that that was our story. Mm -hmm. And I think people see that and think that's the norm. And I would say it's equally very... what happens on the other side is that they never figure it out yeah. and they burn down the village and they never get better. Right. Or maybe it takes a decade later, but by that time the other person's already moved on. Right. You know, that's, it's a serious thing that we're dealing with here. And like, I don't take it lightly by any means. And no. I wish there was like some magic one, two, three process to fix this thing. But really it takes time. It takes time. I mean, it takes what it takes for addicts to get sober and it takes what it takes for codependents to understand their own worth and value and decide to take their happiness into their own hands. Yes. And that's, that's, it's actually a beautiful thing when you can do that. It is. I mean, there's no greater sign of self love and self care than deciding to give up something that you love more than anything in the world for yourself. Yep. It's tough, okay, but it's powerful. So we actually have some guys on our website, um, about disengaging with compassion 
and um, a healing guide for spouses if you want to check those out. There's also a self-care guide in there as well, I think, right? Because mm-hmm. self-care is a huge part of this. I haven't uploaded that one yet. You haven't? No. I'm you working. have to now. I mentioned I'm it. I'm still working on it. <laughs> I think all of this goes in with self-care. But it there's does. a lot. There's a lot of guides in there that y'all can look at. They're completely free. Um, but it, it helps you with this process, kind of puts in a paper for you to help you start changing, you know, having that courage to change. And also there's a book that I recommend to a lot of people called addictive thinking. It's incredible. And it will really help you understand the thought process of an addict and kind of helps you step back a little bit and know that you can't change them. And you can get that on our website as well. Awesome. Well, I think we've about wrapped this up. It's a topic that we've covered before, but something I think is worth mentioning again, and it's incredibly important. And it's something that a lot of our listeners and and the people that follow us are going through right now. Mm-hmm. So I, I, don't, I, I think it's relevant and we'll talk about it as many times as we have to until people feel like they've got a place to go or they they don't feel crazy, they don't feel alone and there are people who are going with, going through what they're going through. Yeah. So here we are again. You're for, not alone. For, for y'all and all the love and, and energy your way. Uh, I hate that you're all going through it, but I promise you it can get better and you can live a fulfilled life when you start focusing on yourself. And you can come out so much stronger. All right. Well, we got anything else? No. Okay. I think that about covers it. Well, we appreciate y'all being here. Um, Please do check out counselingfutures.org and our new website, www.tufo.com, the new and improved Tufo. Or you could do anything from just read about what we're about, check out old podcast episodes, check out free guides, schedule a consultation one-on-one with me or Paige or both of us together. Yep. Um, and I think that about covers it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, until next time, I'm Matt. I'm Paige. And we'll see you. Bye.